I've gotten a lot of requests lately for good references for newborn care, and I appreciate so much the trust that you have in me that you would look to me for this guidance. Obviously, I'm not a pediatrician. I'm not a pediatric nurse practitioner, so it's not my forte, shall we say. But the reality is that after the pregnancy does come baby in the baby carriage, right? So if we talk for 10 whole months about how you don't need this system because you're not sick, it follows that maybe we shouldn't go marching right back into the system after birth, especially if you birthed outside of that system because now they think you're crazy. So today we're going to talk about whether or not well baby visits are needed and how you as mama can learn more about what your baby needs, what is normal, and what's outside of normal. Let's go. Are you a Christian woman yearning for a beautiful, joyful pregnancy and birth with a focus on God, not medical tests? Are you worried the birth you want isn't possible and you're tired of being treated like an accident waiting to happen? Hey mama, I'm Lori, host of Your Birth, God's Way. I'm a certified nurse midwife now, but I wasn't always. After working for nearly 20 years in the broken maternity system, I too was in your shoes wondering how I could have the birth I wanted and that I felt God meant for me to have. I found a secret that has actually been known since the beginning of time. God's way is the best way. Spoiler alert, God made us and our babies and he knows us best. He designed us perfectly for pregnancy, birth, and nourishing our babies after birth if we work with his design and not against it. In this podcast, you'll learn how to be healthy and have joy during this time of life that will be over before you know it. So if you're ready to reclaim your birth and your babies for his glory, go turn on a few episodes of Bluey for that little one on your hip so you can put the focus back on you for a few minutes with me. It's review time and today's review is a little bit different because today I'm bringing you a review about my course, not just the podcast in general. This course, excuse me, this review was left several months ago by one of the people who went through the course live with me. I believe this one was from Sarah. Didn't write the name down, unfortunately. I apologize for that. But I just want to tell you what she had to say about the Your Birth God's Way online Christian childbirth education course that I hope that you are either taking or planning on taking soon. She said it was exactly what I was looking for. Kept God in the center, was natural minded, gave both perspectives from the medical side and the natural side. You gave honest answers of the pros and cons to both sides, which gave us the information to make the decision on our own. Felt like I am getting the whole truth of the situation and the reality of what will be what it will be like to give birth, especially in a hospital. So I, I hope that helps you as you're making your decision. I would love to see you over in the course. You're going to learn so, so much and you're going to walk into into your birth experience, but also your pregnancy and your labor. The whole thing well prepared with information that is balanced that has the medical side plus the natural side so you get both sides of it but then even more than that you get God's side the way that he designed us to work and how we can work with that design so I hope you'll hop over and check that out the links are down in the show notes or you can just go to go.yourbirthgodsway.com and you'll see little buttons as you scroll down there where you can learn more about it so today today we're job we're diving into well baby visits I've gotten a lot of requests lately People are looking for good, excuse me if I just hit their microphone, they're looking for good information about babies, about what's normal, what's not normal. Do they need to go to the doctor for this? Do they need to go to the doctor for that? So I want to preface this by saying I am a certified nurse midwife. Midwifery education includes taking care of the baby for the first 28 days of life. Okay, so about four weeks. That means I'm not an expert. Okay, but I do realize that so many of you have come to trust me because we talk every week for months on end. And so I want to be able to give you some good information for what you can use beyond those 28 days. If you deliver at home with a midwife in those first 28 days, your midwife can help you a whole lot. And she knows when she needs to refer you further, if it's something that really is outside of normal to where you need extra care. But in general, your midwife can take care of you those first four weeks. Beyond that, though, you need a plan, right? So we're going to talk with that. I talk about that today. So as with all episodes, though, I want you to understand these are my opinions and I'm not advising you for or against anything. I really never am. My goal of this podcast is not to convince you of one thing or another. My goal of this podcast is to give you information from a Christian perspective that gives you the balance of the natural side, the medical side, and all the in-betweens 
with an emphasis on God's design so that then you can decide what is best for you and for your family. I always want you to do your own research and to decide what is best for you. Don't don't go based on what I tell you because that might be what's best for me and it may not be what's best for you. I want you to own your care. I want you to evaluate your situation using your intuition and your wisdom to decide what's decide what is best. This is a very controversial topic and for good reason because our babies are precious and we have been led to believe that the only way to keep them safe and healthy is to turn them over to people with letters after their names to tell us that they're safe and they're healthy. But do we find this in scripture? I mean, don't get me wrong. I'm not talking about needing help when there's a serious injury or maybe a serious illness. I'm talking about normal day-to-day wellness and just knowing your child. The Bible never tells us to turn over our parenting or our, our knowledge or our intuition for what we know of our children over to somebody else. We are the parents. God gave your baby to you. You are the one who brings it up, raises it, nourishes it, and does all those things. So just because you don't have a degree from a medical college or a nurse practitioner program or anything like that does not mean that what you know about your baby is invalid, okay? That being said, there is definitely benefit to medical knowledge. And the Bible does reference doctors. Luke was a doctor, we think. So I don't want you to think that they are of no use. That is absolutely not what I'm saying. I just want you to use your critical thinking to decide where and when that knowledge that they have is best applied. I have lots of friends who are doctors. I have lots of respect for the education and training they've gone through. It's just that I don't want you to put all of the weight on them. You are the mother and that means something. God gave you intuition and knowledge and and a brain to think things through and to research and to find things out for yourself. And sadly, in this day and time, walking blindly into the medical system is not a good idea because not everyone is fully thinking for themselves. A lot of doctors, a lot of, in fact, most medical schools are bought and paid for by big pharmaceutical companies. So that means that they are well-trained in giving you medications. They are not well-trained in supporting the body naturally. So given all that, let's move forward. I realized some years ago that it seemed like the well baby visits, the well child visit schedule seemed to really coincide with that shot schedule, right? And we're not going to go into that pretty deep today. I talked about that just a couple episodes ago in a lot of detail. So if you want to learn more about my perspective on that and how the immune system works and all those things, you can go back and listen to that. That's not the subject of today, but I think if you are perceptive and thinking, you have probably realized this too. Being a cash pay patient, we used Samaritan Ministries back when I, well, we still use it, but when I realized this, when you use a healthcare sharing ministry like Samaritan Ministries, well visits are covered by you. Okay. So that kind of stuff is not quote covered. It's not like insurance where your well visits are something that your insurance covers. So that means that every time I went in, I was forking over somewhere around a hundred dollars. That is not a small thing, especially in those early weeks when you're going so often. Okay. Now, granted, I have a little bit of extra training in taking care of babies that maybe some other people don't have. So that gave me a little bit more of a, more comfort. I've worked in neonatal and intensive care units. You know, I had a little bit more experience to fall back on. But don't put so much weight in that that you discount yourself, okay? Because what mom isn't qualified to measure and weigh their baby? Okay, we're going to talk about that in a minute. What mom who's done basic math in school can't plot weights and heights on a growth curve? This is not hard. It's just basic graphing. What mom doesn't know her baby far better than any other person? What mom doesn't notice the smallest changes first before anybody else does? I say all those things to say, you have a lot of knowledge you may not realize and you may discount. And when you start to think through whether or not, especially if you're cash pay, whether you want to pay a hundred bucks, you know, every couple of weeks in those newborn, early newborn weeks, these things play into the equation and they are valid. And I don't want you to completely discount them, especially if you have decided that you are not going to do those shots. I hope I don't get, 
uh, <laughs> censored on YouTube or wherever else this time. But if I do, that's okay. This is valid information because many of us have decided this is not what's best for our babies. And so if we've decided that, and if we've noticed that that's pretty much the only reason we're there for those well visits, it's a good question to think about, do you even need to go? Some may think they don't have this intuition. Some may think that they don't know anything about their baby. Some may have been pushed into the point where they're like, I don't even know what I'm talking about here because this doctor said this and that doctor said that, and it's a whole lot of confusion. But I want you to know that that is due in large part to the world convincing you that your intuition is nothing. But let me tell you, that is not true. You need to listen to your gut more and you need to listen to the noise of the world, which is designed to drown out God less. Okay. If there's one thing I can tell you today, if there's one walk away point today, that's it. Listen to your gut more, the intuition that God gave you. And listen to the world's confusion less. Listen to your God who loves you and loves your baby and who gave you the good sense to figure some stuff out. Okay. So first let's talk about what happens at well child visits or well baby visits. Kind of depends on the practitioner, but in general, the things that happen in those early visits for babies is length and weight checks because they're wanting to make sure that your baby is growing on the curve, as they say. They'll probably do some question and answer if they're good, if they give you time to talk. They'll listen to the baby's heart and lungs. They will do a physical exam sometimes, sometimes, um, and then the shots come around. Okay, so that's your normal visit. You know, they come in, they strip them down to the diaper, weigh them, do all those things, check them out, all that. Okay, can you do these things well on your own as a parent? It does not require a degree to know if your baby is growing well. Do you hear me? It doesn't require a degree to know if your baby is growing well. The world has convinced you you can't breastfeed and your baby's not going to gain enough weight and all these things, right? It's not always true. In fact, with my kids, they were growing so fast. They were on the upper end of it because <laughs> the milk gives them everything they need and more. They are strong and healthy. You don't need a degree to know whether your baby is growing well. I personally do have the degrees, and that made me feel a little bit better about my ability to draw back from the system. The system that I believe wholeheartedly is making us sick because I knew the things to look for. But that doesn't mean that you can't do the same. We're going to talk about some ways for you to do that here in a few minutes. I just want you to remember that you can weigh a baby. There are pretty simple ways to do that. You don't have to have the big medical scale, even if it's just holding your baby in your arms and weighing that way, and then putting the baby down and weighing yourself and doing the subtraction, then you can figure out what the baby's weight is. You're gonna need a scale. It's a little bit more accurate for that, just so you can get down to the ounces, but that's not that hard. And then you can take the weights that you get and you can plot them or just write them down and see that your baby is growing well. In the show notes, you're going to find a link for growth charts. You can get growth charts that you can plot your own baby's weight on yourself. I did this. I have them in my baby books for all three of my kids. And that way you can see for yourself if they are growing on, quote, the curve. Now, a word about the curve. There are curves for breastfed babies and there are curves for formula babies. If you get one that doesn't specify breastfed, it is probably just the one that is based on all babies, which will include formula babies, which are not the same. They don't gain weight on the same, at the same, uh, excuse me, at the same rate in the same way that breastfed babies do. So try to look for, and I didn't check, and I apologize for this. I didn't check to see if there is one on that website. It was the CDC website, but if there's not, you can look it up. You can just Google, you know, breastfeeding growth charts to where you can find a growth chart that is appropriate for the way that you're feeding your baby. It does not matter. If your baby is on the upper end of normal or the lower end of normal, what matters is that your baby's growth trends, shall we say, are consistent, okay? So that means that if we're growing at a certain rate, we kind of keep that up and there's not a sudden drop off, if that makes sense. So that's really what matters the most is that they're just having consistent growth and consistent weight gain and that your milk is 
consistently transferring to the baby well. And beyond that, you really just don't need to worry. And half the time, I mean, you don't, I don't want you to go home thinking, I've got to start weighing my baby. No. If you have no signs or symptoms that your baby's not growing well, quit worrying about it. If you're feeding your baby every two, three hours on the early days and maybe closer to three hours, every three hours, maybe closer to four hours as they're getting a little bit older, you are fine as long as the baby's gaining weight and looks healthy. I don't want you to worry yourself sick. That's the big thing. It's like, I don't want this episode to put stress on you to where you are having more anxiety. No, this episode is designed to give you less anxiety. And I hope that is what the end game will be. Let's talk about some alternatives to tra traditional care providers. So there are obviously pediatricians whose specialty is taking care of children. Okay. Sadly, most pediatricians are going to want you to only do things one way. And that is the way of the CDC, which is going to tell you to take I don't know what's it up to 80 or 90 shots some somewhere in that range in the first five years of life if that's not your cup of tea like it wasn't my cup of tea then you might want to look into finding either a pediatrician who supports your choice supports you as a parent as for being able to make your own choices truly supports you doesn't make you feel bad or find a tradition or a, an alternative care provider what are some alternative types of care providers people like naturopaths people like homeopaths people like chiropractors, people like family doctors, family practice doctors who still um, practice in a way that truly is family care and not just algorithm based or doing what the drug companies tell them. They are still out there. They're a little harder to find, but they're there. And there's others as well. And I'm sure that you know some. I would encourage you to look for those groups on Facebook of the natural minded moms in your area, the crunchy moms, for lack of a better term because that's where you're gonna find the people who know how to find these types of practitioners if you don't know yourself. Now, sometimes just a simple search on the internet will help you find people, but sometimes it's a little harder. They're not always um, as mainstream, so sometimes it's harder to find them. But the people around you who think like you will be able to help you. Look for those people. So let's talk about some ways that you can need a care provider less, okay? Because our goal is to be healthy and have healthy, well children to where you don't need care, right? You don't need this quote health care that's not even health care in our country. It's more like sick care, right? But I digress. What can you do to need these providers less to, to have less of a need for ever even going there? Nourish your body well throughout pregnancy and nourish your baby well after pregnancy. Give birth naturally so that you are not getting extra drugs into your baby's system and you're not impacting the way that your baby is born. Your baby is born the way that God intended it to be. So it's getting things like good lung squeeze when it's coming out. It's getting good microbiome from your um, vaginal flora as it's being born. All of these things, uh, things like delayed cord clamping, and really it ought to just be like, I, I don't even know why that's a thing, calling it delayed cord clamping. No, you just wait because the placenta is not done yet. Let the placenta finish doing its job so that the baby gets all of its blood back before you sever that cord. Things like this are gonna make a big difference in the baby's overall health leading into those first several months. Then breastfeed exclusively at least six months, at least, and then continue to breastfeed even after your baby starts to show interest in food and is starting to eat things. Still mainly breastfeed. Your baby's main source of nutrition for the first year of life should be breast milk. That is a way to make sure that your, that your baby is as healthy as he can be and so that you need a care provider less. Do not feed conventional cereals or formulas or any other processed foods ever, ever. That stuff, I don't even know how they call it food. It is laced with all kinds of chemicals, not to mention the pesticides and um, the herbicides that are on it that were sprayed on these things before they were processed into cereals or what have you, make your own baby food. If you if you desire to go the baby food route, some people don't go that route. Some people just start giving them um, foods that are like finger foods. But if you go the baby food route, try to make your own using food that you've grown or that you know the source of that doesn't have any of those chemicals that we just talked about on it. And then just know your baby well. Baby wear them, you know, like with the carriers and different things to wear your babies against your body at all times. So you know them well and they're right there with you and you sense anything that might be out of the ordinary early. Stay home with your children. 
and you're going to know them better than anyone when you turn them over to somebody else for, you know, 8, 10, 12 hours a day and you're only getting a little snapshot at the first of the day and the end of the day, you really don't know them that well. You don't know what's normal for them as much. So if at all possible, find a way to be home with your baby so you know them well. And then co-sleep safely so that you have them near you at night, which helps them to be regulated by your body at all times, as well as continuing the nourishment and nutrition through the night with those um, through the night feedings. If you want to know more about co-sleeping and how to make that safe, go back to episode 90. We talked about that there. Then we want to get some good books. We need to have a good library, a good reference library to have places to go when you have questions, when you're like, "Yeah, hey, is this normal? Is this not normal? You need a place to go. Okay, so let's talk about some places to go. Place one is a an old book. And if you're uh, watching anywhere, if I use this as a clip, don't go looking on YouTube for this whole video. It's not all there. But if you're finding clips later, I'll show you that this book right here, it's an old book and it looks a little bit blurry on the screen if you are able to see it. How to Raise a Healthy Child in Spite of Your Doctor. And this is by Rod Robert Mendelson. This is, I think it was published in 87, but um, it is excellent. And I want to read to you just a little bit from it. Okay. Um, this is just a, about three or four paragraphs. If you have the book already, it's on page six if you want to read along. This is the first of chapter two. The title of the chapter, and remember, this is written by a physician, a medical doctor. Parents and grandparents are wiser than doctors. Parents often believe I'm joking when I tell them that mothers, fathers, and grandparents are more capable than doctors of managing the health of, the, of children. Yet I firmly believe it for reasons that are at once simple and profound. Unless you have passed the half-century mark... And we're brought up outside the major cities of our country. You can't be expected to remember the classic family doctor. For today, there are scarcely any to be found. Those of us who can remember them are apt to do so with feelings of warmth and affection. For we recall the family doctor as a friendly, sensitive, unpretentious, reassuring, compassionate figure in our lives. The family doctor of that era often had been intimately involved with our families for two, three, and even four generations. He knew each of us as individual personalities, was sensitive to our attitudes, moods, and idiosyncrasies. He viewed us as human beings in need of help, not as clinical subjects for all of the techno technological and pharmacological interventions that doctors today have substituted for careful examination and common sense. I mean, that, those three paragraphs right there alone, those three paragraphs alone are a reason enough for you to go find this book. Um, towards the end of the next paragraph, he says, if we needed a pill, we got one. But more often, he allayed our fears and anxieties with nothing more than calm assurance, reassurance and a friendly pat on the head and let nature do its work without interference. That is a good doctor. And this book right here will help you raise a healthy child in spite of your doctor. Another book that I would recommend you have is called The Portable Pedi Pediatrician. I'm not going to hold it up because most people are going to see this anyway, but it's about, let's see, one, two, three, four, five different Dr. Sears's. <laughs> William Sears, Martha Sears, Robert Sears, James Sears, and Peter Sears, all MDs. Um, the reason that I like this book a lot is because at the beginning of the book, it goes through what is done at each of the well visits and about when they happen. So you can go through there and look and you can see for yourself what they do with the visits and whether or not that's something that you think needs to be done or if that's something that you think you could do yourself or if you think you need to go in and have a physician do that for you. It gives you the ability to make the decision yourself and then towards the back, it goes through every symptom, illness, whatever under the sun and what it means, what they're going to do in the medical system. So then you can decide for yourself what to do with various situations. Now, all of these books that I'm going to mention are in the show notes below and also on my resources page. So you can get the links. You don't have to like write them all down. They're all down there. Another good book is called Be Your Own Doctor. I actually got this book or... I didn't get it from my Amish friends, but I got it because of my Amish friends because we were having a conversation one day when I was up there visiting and getting some things from them. And she had this book, um, the lady that I go to um, every two weeks, she had this book sitting out. So we started talking about it. So I came home and ordered it. And um, it's a really good book. It goes through all kinds of older um, remedies that 
have lots of validity, but no one really does them anymore. So I would encourage you to, to look that up and see if that's something that might um, fit well on your bookshelf. And then there's also that same, I think it's the same author, wrote Be Your Own, Be Your Child's Pediatrician. Same idea. This one's just aimed at children. So those are four books that I would recommend you have um, just as reference in case you need them. That all being said, let's talk about some big things to be aware of in newborns, okay? Because most of your babies are going to be totally normal and you really don't need, quote, need well child care for them most of the time. They are healthy. Why would we take a healthy baby to a place where sick children go, right? That's kind of the side I fell down on. I just decided that my babies were not sick and I didn't need to go to a place where sick people went. Same way as I don't think that pregnant women need to go where sick people are. They're not sick. They're having a baby. It's not a sickness. But sometimes babies do get sick, as we know. So some things you need to be looking for and aware of and just kind of have them in the back of your head. I don't want you to stress about these things. I don't want you sitting there staring at your baby scared to death. You don't have to put these monitors on them to where you can watch them every second of the day. That's not necessary. But these are just things to have in the back of your mind as things to be aware of. Thing one, a temperature over 100.4. Now, that is pretty low for like most kids, older kids. If 100.4 fever for most kids is not something you necessarily have to be seen for. But for a newborn, it is something that you don't want to ignore because any temperature in a baby needs attention. Okay. Any temperature at all. So if your baby gets a temperature of 100.4 or higher, you need to have your baby seen. If your baby is lethargic, that means truly like floppy. You can't wake them up for anything. And I'm not just talking about they're in a deep sleep. I'm talking about like they're sick. They've got that sick look to them and you just can't get them to wake up. That is definitely something you need to be seen for. If they have fast or labored breathing, babies very often, in fact, almost always tell us they are sick through their respiratory system. And so it's not, and I, I mentioned the temperature, but very often the fever is not the first thing you're going to see in a baby. Very often the first thing you're going to see is either a high breathing rate, something over 60 breaths a minute. So like every, you know, every second they're maybe breathing more than once per second. It, you, you notice it. They look like they're breathing too fast. That or if they're having accessory muscle use, that means retractions. Maybe you might see their nose flaring. You might see the muscles under their ribs kind of sucking in and things like that. Anything like that is showing that the baby's having to work a little bit harder to breathe and they will maintain for a long time and then they won't. And quickly they can go from being okay to being sick. So if your baby's breathing too fast or showing signs that they're having to work harder to breathe, then you would want to get them seen. If the baby's not having enough wet diapers, a rough guide is about the number of wet diapers per day of life. So up, up till six days. So if your baby is four days old, you would expect about four wet diapers a day. If your baby is six days old, about six wet diapers a day. Past that, it doesn't just keep going up. Six wet, six wets a day is about right. Um, but that's just a rough guide. It doesn't have to be exact. You'll get to know what's normal for your baby, but as long as they're feeding well and giving you wet diapers, that's a good sign. If they're not having bowel movements, now for breastfed babies, usually they're going to have at least one a day. Honestly, most breastfed babies get to the point where they're pooping every time they eat. It's just kind of a closed system and everything's connected. So stuff goes in, so something's got to come out, but that's not always the case. So, um, but usually about one dirty diaper a day is going to be your standard. Now, will they skip days? Yes, but they really shouldn't be skipping much in those early, early days. So just keep an eye on that. And then if there's any blue lips, blue extremities, or that mottled look, if you don't know what modeling is, you can look it up online because I can't really describe it, but it's just a strange pattern on the skin that um, is related to circulation. If you see that, you definitely want to have your baby seen. Now that's just a short list that does not include everything under the sun, obviously, but those are just some go-to things for things that are outside of normal that you would want to keep an eye on with your new baby when you get home. Again, I'm not advising you to have well baby visits or not to. I'm not advising anything I'm, other than I'm advising you to be the parent and you to decide and you to gather information so that you can make an informed decision this podcast is just a piece of that. It is not all of that. This is just the first step. I wanted to give you guys some information because so many of you have contacted me about this, kind of feeling a little bit lost, like you kind of had it all together up until the birth. And then after that, you're like, now what? 
you know, and I totally get that because we're all there, especially first time moms. But my whole goal here is for you to rely more on your intuition and then on the things that you're just kind of feeling like you need a little help on, you find the resources, you start to read and you get more information so that you can make good choices. Do some more research, get at least one of those books, maybe all of them. Again, the links are going to be down in the show notes or on my resources page, kind of sort of, kind of toward the bottom. Um, I have a section for um, baby care, that kind of thing. So you can find them all there. Let me think. I think it's go.yourbirthgodsway.com slash resources. Go check those out. Get you at least a couple of them. You can get, you might even be able to get them on um, used book websites. Those links there are going to all be for Amazon, but you can get them other places too. Um, but have at least one of those books and then read a lot so that you can make informed decisions because you are the mama and you are the boss. That's really it. You are the mama. You are the boss. And that's what I want you to remember. Doctors are great resources when you need them, but they are not the be all end all. And I want you to know that. I want you to know that you know your baby better than anybody. And I want you to learn to rely on that. Now, don't forget, there are lots of ways for you to work with me. So if you're pregnant or you're trying to get pregnant, we're not to the point yet that we need the well baby care. Be sure to check out the show notes for links for all the ways you can work with me as well. You can also get the links to the books. All the goodies are down there. Go check them out. I'm going to see you right back here again next week. Can't wait. Be sure if you haven't already, by the way, go leave me a quick five-star written review over on Apple Podcasts, and you might hear your review on here next week. And otherwise, see you next week. Real quick, if today's episode blessed you in any way, would you head over to Apple Podcasts and leave me a quick five-star written review? It'll take you less than a minute, but it's the best thank you you can give me. And it will help my show to reach more mamas just like you so we can all find God's best for our families. I'll see you right back here in a few days.